Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Outliers YouTube channel and our program, Get to Know. I'm your host, D.P. Lyle, and I'm here with my partner in crime, Kathleen Antrim. Thanks, Doug. It is great to be here. We've got a very special interview uh, today with uh, J. Todd Scott. He's a best-selling author. He's critically acclaimed. He spent many years in the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, and I'm just really excited to have you here, Todd. Uh, welcome to Get to Know. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So I like to ask this question, and, um, <laughs> and Doug says you need a couch, you need to go lay down on it. Uh, <laughs> So, and you've got one right there, so you could get caught. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, I want to know about your childhood and whether you feel your childhood um, really played a part in you becoming a writer. And, oh. you know, were you an introverted child? Were you an extroverted child? Were you an athlete? Um, you know, did it have, play any part at all in you getting into the arts? Yeah, I, th I think it did. You know, not in the sense that. I necessarily draw from my my childhood uh, in my stories, which are much darker and bleaker than my actual childhood was. I had a pretty I had a pretty good childhood <laughs> all the way around. But, you know, I, I was introverted in the sense that, uh, you know, I've always been creative. Uh, you know, I was always that kid that had a lot going on in my my head all the time. And I was probably much quieter and, and, and introverted in grade school and into high school then I later become as I as it became as I got a little bit older and got kind of got out in the world but um so I've always had that creative bent uh that was always just kind of how how I was and then also my family my mom and dad were big readers uh as was my grandparents and so when, on the summers when I would go up to Paducah which is where I was was born um just kind of out in the western part of the state uh, my grandfather had a farm out there and he had a back room. It's kind of an addition, a built on room to the house. And he just had books uh, from everywhere about every topic imaginable. He was just kind of a kind of a reader. And um, so when I would go up there for the summers and spend a couple of weeks, I would, you know, grab the stack of books and, and go through them. And then my parents were were big readers. So there was always books around the house. It was just what what they did. And so, you know, my mother would take me about when I was in seventh eighth grade we'd go to the local library like every tuesday and so i'd have a week to read whatever i got you know from tuesday to tuesday so you know i'd come out with a stack of books and be reading like a like a fiend um so you know you take my kind of just general uh, you know quiet introspection kind of creative mind and you uh douse it with uh, the gasoline of reading all the time and books <laughs> yeah. everywhere uh then uh, you know, reading and writing and narrative and storytelling has been a part of, of my life as long as I can remember. How old were you when you started writing? Well, I, you know, I got asked this recently, and I think when I was like in fourth or fifth grade, you had to do this uh, make your own book contest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you wrote your book and you bound it. And it was this whole thing that you did. Uh, you brought your little bound book into school and everyone brought in their books and they were all very nice, you know, and mine was this, you know, hundred page tome. It looked like something wow. that, uh, you know, it was this massive book. It was like the first in a trilogy. And my <laughs> teachers were, uh, you know, that's a lot of pages for like, yeah, you know, so I, I was, uh, and I haven't stopped writing at that length, uh, since really, I kind of, everything I write is long, but uh, even back then, I mean, I was trying my hand at stories and writing. I can remember doing that all through grade school and in high school, you know, teaching myself to kind of type and hunt and peck my way through stories of all different types. I did it uh, into college uh, and then after college as well uh, for several years, kind of wrote on my own. And then um, I stopped for about 20 plus, 20 plus years. Was there a pivotal moment that made you stop? Did something happen or did you just get busy with life? You know, I think I got busy with life. I mean, I had kind of thought you know, tossed around the idea of getting an MFA, uh, you know, a master's in writing as I was leaving college. I had some uh, professors pushing me that way. I was involved in a lot of creative writing classes and things like that in college and uh, was involved in, you know, literary magazines and kind of doing stuff like that. And so I, I had an inkling that it was, you know, a, a, obviously it was a passion, a love of mine, but I just didn't think I could make a living doing that. And um, <laughs> so I went and went to law school and then became a federal agent. And as all of that stuff kind of took over 
uh, my life than the writing, which I, you know, still loved, uh, kind of took a backseat. So where'd you go to law school? Uh, I went to, it was, at the time, at, back then, it was called the George Mason School of Law. Now it's the Antonin Scalia School of Law. And it's, mm -hmm. it's part of George Mason University up in Northern Virginia. Yeah, yeah. I know. That's very cool. familiar yeah, with it. Very very, cool. Cool. Yeah. And, and so you ended up in the DEA for a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. What kind of stuff did you get involved in there? And and uh, where were you stationed? Did you move around a lot? Or oh, yeah. You... Yeah, I, I moved around quite a bit. I, when I was hired on, I, I got... Back then, the the idea was they didn't want you to go back anywhere near home, and right. I had, uh, you know, grew up on out here, you know, kind of in the east or Midwest, had gone to school uh, in Virginia, so uh, had gone to law school in Virginia, and um, so when I joined up, they sent me about as far away as they could. I went to Los Angeles, and this was in the <laughs> early to mid nineties. So I'd never been that far away from home. Had never been out to the West Coast. Uh, never seen a city that size, really. You know, I got off the plane in LA and I'm like, and LA has no drug issues, so no, you know. no <laughs> drug issue at all, <laughs> <laughs> right? And that was still, you know, you still had a lot of Colombian traffickers working in LA at the time, right. and so it's kind of like being thrown in in the deep end of the ocean. Uh, and it was an amazing experience. I mean, I, you know, I had a mullet and a shoulder holster, and you know, I had watched a lot of Miami Vice and things like that, and I pretty much <laughs> thought I knew exactly what I was going to do. Uh, but I had a great start to my career, uh, spent, uh, you know, quite a few years out there, then went overseas for a couple of years. I was in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. You know, I didn't oh, think wow. that the LA drug problem was bad enough. I wanted to go find someplace that was even worse. <laughs> uh, so I spent a, a few years in, in Haiti, which is a, can be a beautiful country, but it's a very difficult place. Um, and then, uh, bounced around as you kind of have to do in our career. I spent a, a couple different times uh, on the border, a couple different times in Arizona, a couple different uh, tours uh, in Texas, and basically moved about 10 times over my nearly 30 year uh, career. So, were you got to cover do, a lot? Uh, I, I was earlier in my career as I got mm -hmm. on. I, you know, I didn't leave that kind of to the younger guys. Uh, so, yeah, I bought a lot of dope early in my career, um, you know, about a lot of meth and uh, weed and, and coke and things like that, uh, the bikers and, and a lot of that stuff uh, earlier in my career. And I love that. That was great. You know, not every agent has to do it, but but uh, I enjoyed it and, and had that experience. And, you know, so in my career, I got to work in big offices and small offices. I got to work on the border. I got to work overseas. Uh, I traveled a bunch overseas. I had cases that took me really all over the world. I was in Australia and Germany and uh, oh, Switzerland wow. and a bunch of different places. So, you know, there really wasn't much in my DEA career that I didn't get to do. I'm not saying I did it well, all of it, <laughs> but, you know, well, I did get to experience. I, I assume you got into some dicey situations as an undercover agent. I mean, yeah, yeah you're I got talking it. about out on the tether. That's uh, you're way out on the point of the spear, as it were. Yeah, no, it, it's, um, as I said, it's not something that you're required to do. You're required to kind of practice it. Uh, it's something you do a lot in our academy before you get out on, on the street. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I was fortunate to be mentored by some folks who had done undercover for almost their entire careers. Uh, wow. Really, really high stakes undercover. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a skill, uh, like anything else uh, in law enforcement, um, but it was one I was kind of uniquely suited to do, you know, because I like stories and, you know, undercover, 90% yeah. of it is bullshitting and telling stories. That's, that's really what it is. That's what I was going to ask. Do you think that your yeah. time undercover in that thing has helped you create characters and tell stories? Oh, sure. Sure. And I think just being in law enforcement, I, I mean, the, the, some of the best <clears throat> storytellers I've ever encountered are, you know, cops and, um, you know, military guys, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because what do you do? You sit around and tell stories all the time. You, you know, you've got these very interesting careers that have moments of panic and dread right. and then lots of kind of sitting around. I mean, that's, right. you know, when you're on surveillance, you know, you might get in a car chase, but you might be sitting there three days before that happens. And what do you do? You tell stories and cops tend to tell the same stories over and over again and just make them funnier and cooler. <laughs> and, and, you know, 
exaggerate a little and and so it's it's bigger yeah the fish the fish gets bigger and so you know it's great practice uh in just telling stories and seeing people's reactions it's kind of like improv and and undercover is kind of like that too you're telling a story uh, a little bit of truth surrounded by a lot of lie and you know can you convince somebody of of something and so i think that all kind of you know, wove together into the writing, you know, that I did, particularly my first few books, which were, were you know, really kind of spun out of the work that I was doing at that right. time on the, on the border, <laughs> less so with the later few, but, um, you know, that was stuff that I was living and breathing and doing every day. So it was a natural transition. Once I started to write again, after that long hiatus. Yeah. When, when, when was that? When did you spin out of the DEA and decide, okay, now I'm a writer? Well, you know, I, I actually <laughs> did both for many years. Right. I, I juggled. Exactly. Um, so I started writing again in earnest around 2011 or 2012. And actually, I, you know, how I what I did is I was assigned to headquarters on my career path. You had to go spend a little bit of time in headquarters, which no one wants to do. But but I, I had to. So I was in the up in D uh, up in D.C. in our headquarters. And the unit I was in was in public affairs. Uh, Because they're like, you know, Todd doesn't mind talking on the phone. And, you know, Todd kind of has an interest in in stories and writing. We've heard a little bit about that. So he can talk to newspapers and magazines and anyone who had an interest in DEA. I was the agent, the throwdown agent. So if you were writing a book about DEA, making a movie about DEA, TV series, I was the guy that you would go talk to about what it was like to be an agent. And from doing that, I had you know, more than one director, producer, writer say, you know what, maybe you should actually write some of this stuff yourself. (laughs) And I said, okay. So I actually did NaNoWriMo, which the national novel writing, you know, and I said, well, I'll, I'll try that. If I can crank out, um, you know, was it 50, 60,000 words, whatever it is, 50,000 words, I think it is in a month, then maybe I I can really take another stab at this. And that's what I did. I actually sat down and did NaNoWriMo and started writing again and then never and never stopped. But it came from that time in headquarters, people talking about it and then uh, doing that national novel writing competition. That's fantastic. Yeah. And so you, you've written how many novels now have you published? Uh, six. OK. And and uh, you had a series of, of uh, what, three books and was in one series and then you yeah. did some other stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a trilogy um, that was set in West Texas. It was a Chris Cherry series or the Big Ben uh, series. Um, And they were all really kind of noir, border, crime novels. Uh, Often have been compared to kind of what Don Winslow was doing with his cartel uh, books. We tread a lot of the same ground talking about uh, drug trafficking and the border and cartels and all that. I focused on a on a young sheriff who, or, or young deputy who ends up becoming a sheriff throughout the three, three books. Um, but it, you know, that really, really kind of border crime, hard crime stuff. Um, and then I did lost river, which was a book set in Kentucky before I moved back here actually. And, uh, that was a book, uh, really about DEA. The first three books weren't, um, about DEA mentioned, drug enforcement what but we're really about the agency lost river focused one of the main characters two of the characters were uh da agents a female da agent and her partner working in eastern kentucky and it really dealt with the opioid uh crisis which i had seen firsthand knew a lot about um sure. and uh so it was again was another crime novel set over a 24-hour period kind of a one night crime occurs and um all the things that spin out of that Uh, And then um, I did two books that were kind of wildly different. I did a book about a cult uh, Mm -hmm. that I had long wanted to to write. And I followed that up with a book that's probably more thriller, suspense thriller than than necessarily a hard crime novel. Uh, And that was about a plane crash in West Virginia. And obviously there's a lot more than a plane crash. Um, and that's the one that I, I guess I was the finalist here this last year at International Thriller uh, Writers. Yep, that's the one right there. Yep, um, yep. claimed. Um, yes. Yeah, congratulations on your nomination. That is not easy. Yeah, to- that 
that's great. Yes. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And it came out of the blue. I wasn't expecting it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a book I, I'm proud of. It was a book that I, I, one of the few that I struggled to write a little bit, um, because at the time I was writing it, I was, you know, still working at DEA and I was also, uh, had taken a, a few weeks off and was out in LA, um, working on a TV series, which was the, the one for Paramount Lawman Bass Reeves. Mm -hmm. And so I was juggling a lot and trying to finish that, uh, book and, the book is about people trapped on a mountain and you know at a book event not long ago i said i felt like i was trapped on that mountain too for, <laughs> for weeks on end because i just couldn't seem to get you know get to the end of that end of that book <laughs> stories do take you hostage sometimes yes yeah, they so do true. well i was going to ask you about the, the paramount thing with bass reeves um how did you was that because of your connection here in la or did that come about with another another um another pathway how did you end up doing well that? I, you know i've been very fortunate and in, in all of us who write you know probably have had these experiences where our books get optioned and no and no one makes a tv or movie series but they option right. them and right. you talk to producers and you talk to directors and all that and i was fortunate that all my earlier books were optioned so i just kind of got talking to folks and you know we got down the rabbit hole pretty far with a couple of them where i was talking you know you were meeting with actors and you were uh, you know, actually in, you know, sitting at HBO, uh, given yeah. the full pitch and, you know, you've got your director on one side and your actor on the other, and it, you know, it sounds great. And, you know, I'm already ready to retire and, and go off and be a full-time Hollywood <laughs> mogul. Um, but, you know, threading that needle is very, very hard to do as, as I know you all are aware, but because of that, and because I spent some time with some folks doing that and they liked my writing and they kind of liked me, uh, I was offered some opportunities to, you know, work, you know, write on a feature film, write on a TV pilot, write on, and I just kind of get, kind of got these things pitched to me to do. And my answer always was yes. You know, I'd never written a script, but I could figure it out. I could Google it and look it up. And so I just <laughs> exactly. kept writing. <laughs> so I yesed my way into a, a writer's room. I, uh, uh, the, the showrunner for, for Bass Reeves knew me, knew my writing, uh, he had called on a couple things, kept asking me if I was ready to retire from DEA. And I said, no, I'm not ready. And when he called on, on Bass Reese, he said, well, you know, just take a few weeks off and come out, make it a vacation and um, just help us out. And, you know, you're, you can work as a consultant. You'll be the consultant or consulting producer. Cause you know, about carrying a badge and a gun and all that, all of which, you know, helped in the show. So I got to go out, be in the writer's room and do and spend some time with some really fabulous writers and kind of see how the TV side of, of things work. And as I was flying out of town, they said, hey, we're going to give you an episode. Go write this. Go write this episode. And wow. um, and I did. And uh, and Bass Reeves is very well received. It's done very, very well. And um, because of that, that's why I was out in L.A., here recently, um, starting work, hopefully on what will be another show. So, uh, but again, it just kind of came well, because of my novels. It's interesting lately, you know, there's because of this and other things, Bass Reeves has kind of popped up on the national psyche. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's amazing how many people did not know who he was before all of this. And, but Bass Reeves was one tough dude. Oh, what yeah. did you, what did you learn about him doing this thing? that was the most intriguing or interesting or shocking or fascinating thing that you learned about this, this gentleman? Uh, well, I, I think how much, and we tried to capture this a little bit in, in the series, right? I mean, he was a tremendous shot. I mean, he was yep. known for, for being a great shot. He was a big guy. Um, very, very tough. He could speak the language uh and you know was pretty much not afraid of anything or anyone i mean he arrested three thousand people and never got hurt doing it which is a phenomenal number exactly. when you think about it yeah. but i think the the thing that really impressed me was a lot of what he did was because he was not because he was a great shot and tough although that helped it was because he was really smart and you know he did undercover right i mean he tried every way possible to arrest these guys where he didn't have to shoot everyone where they were standing and he was a good investigator. And because, and because he could speak the language and can cross the border and go in Indian territory, you know, he kind of uh, developed this idea of, of informants and snitches and paying people for help and getting information. And when you look at his 
cases and how a lot of them kind of played out or his arrest played out, you know, it was as much the brains that he brought to it and kind of the craftiness as just, you know, pulling up on a horse and waving a gun at people. And so we we tried to capture a, a little bit of that, um, you know, the kind of wisdom that he had, uh, the, the kind of brains that he brought brought to it. And I think that's um, real a legacy that, that he that he has for, for what he did. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So what are you working on now? Uh, well, I just turned in a uh, my latest novel. So we'll see uh, what everyone thinks about that. Agents and publishers have that. Uh, I just wrote a short story, which I don't know what I'm going to do with because I generally don't write short stories. And as I said, I don't really write short. So it's 50 pages, you know, like 13,000 words or 60 pages, 13,000 words. I guess that's not quite a short story anymore. No. <laughs> Almost a no novella. You're moving into the yeah. novella world yeah. now, yeah. but but that's um, okay too. <laughs> I, have a, I have a feature film that I co-wrote with uh, some folks that I know out uh, in LA and we're, um, you know, working on, on developing that. Um, and I'm working on a screenplay of my own that we hope to develop. And uh, I'll start my next my next novel in about three weeks and this TV show that I went out and I can't unfortunately talk too much about that because right. it's still, in, you know, early, but assuming that lands where we hope it will and everything, then I'll be back out in LA for the full writer's room, not just as a guest, not just as a consultant, but for the full writer's room here in about another month and a half or so. And, and the big oh. difference between a few years ago and now as I actually did retire from DEA. We have a mandatory retirement age and I was coming up on it. They were going to throw me out no, no matter what. <laughs> and um, so I retired uh, a few months ago and now for the first time ever have been a full-time uh, writer, not an agent and a writer, uh, but a full-time writer. And so, you know, I've been trying to write as much as I can about anything that I can Um you know, to kind of make up for uh, some of the lost time when I was juggling both things. Yeah, that had to be a lot to be juggling both. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll have to have you back. You're a fantastic yes. interview Thank and you. really looking forward to your feature films, your show. We'll have to have you back to talk about all of that. Yes. This is Jay Todd Scott, phenomenal author. Again, congratulations on your nomination for International Thriller Writers for a uh, Best what best paperback, I believe. Yeah, yeah, best original yeah. paperback. Yep. And I'm gonna ask our viewers to please click the thumbs up. It helps with the algorithms and gets these interviews out. And if you like what we're doing here, please subscribe. And again, thank you so much. We'll have you back. Doug, to you. Yeah, thanks, Todd. This is fantastic. Uh and when your next book is is reaching fruition yes. or whatever let us know we'll get you back in here and we'll chat some more it's just been a pleasure and especially get to talk to another southern boy being from <laughs> alabama myself it's <laughs> always it's always good um so i want to thank everybody for watching this has been get to know uh with uh, todd scott here on uh the outliers youtube channel and we will be back uh with other interviews before too long until then hang in there thank you